So uh, thank you for that great introduction. I feel like I learned things about myself. That's always good. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today. I want to thank Heather for inviting me. Um, can you all hear me OK? I, I'm not going to use the microphone unless I have to. OK. So I'm going to talk to you today about some work that we've been doing looking at putting images into search results. And this is work that I did with my colleague Jaime Arguello, uh, who's also an assistant professor at UNC, and also Falk Scholler, who's at RMIT in Melbourne and was visiting UNC last year, and we had a great collaboration. So uh, who was the visiting person? You know, you have these great collaborations that come out of visits. So um, let's see if I can get my clicker to work here. Come on. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. There we go. OK, so to start with, this is a search engine result page, right? When you issue a search, uh, this is what you get back. Sometimes we call it the 10 blue links. Um, we'll call this a SERP, search engine result page, in, in the parlance. And I want to point out a few things about these SERPs. First of all, they're consisting of individual results, right? So they're individual results that underlie each of these things. Here's a search I did for Vancouver in preparation for the trip. And here's a particular entry on Wikipedia, right? So I can see that's one result. And what this is really doing is it's trying to give me some hints about what I would find if I clicked on that result, right? So if I clicked on this link, I'd go to the Wikipedia page, and this result on the SERP is trying to tell me what I would find there. And in that way, we can think of this as being a surrogate for the underlying page. It's a proxy. It's something that's sort of standing in, because we can't show you the entire page, but it's going to give us some idea of what's there, OK? Um, and so web result surrogates, surrogates for web pages, typically consist of a title, a URL, and a text snippet. And this is what we typically see, right? Um, and that represents the underlying page. But there are other kinds of surrogates out there, right? If I do a search and I click on the news links, so if I want to see what the news for Vancouver is, well, then I see something like this. And these surrogates are a little different. They still have a title to the news story, but now they tell me what the news source was, the Vancouver Sun or whatever it is. Uh, they also tell me what the time that that story was uh, reported, four hours ago, a day ago, whatever. And then they also give a little text snippet but you might be noticing there's another component here, right? Let's so talk about images. There are images. OK. So there are images for news stories, but they're not for web results. Well, news stories tend to have images that go with them. And that picture can help you understand something about the context of that story. It helps convey additional information for the surrogate. Well, there are other surrogates. Uh, we might have surrogates for shopping results. We might have surrogates for videos. We might have surrogates for images. If I do an image search, I'm going to get images as part of that surrogate. And all these different surrogates have images, but web result surrogates tend not to. Okay, so we thought that was kind of weird, and we were curious about that. So let me show you another search that I did. This one was about jaguars. And so I put the search in, and here's the SERP that came back. And if you're looking at this, you might notice that Jaguar is sort of an ambiguous term here. Am I talking about the cars, or am I talking about the cat animals, right? Well, in the face of that ambiguity, what did the search, ter uh, the search engine do? It returned back what I would call a diversified set of results. I gave it an ambiguous term. It's not sure which I meant. And so a smart strategy for it is to give me back results for both or whatever different number of senses there are. It turns out there's also a sports team called the Jacksonville Jaguars. So it gave me that kind of at the bottom, just in case I was interested in that. So you can sort of see here that because I entered an ambiguous query, it gave me these diversified results. Um, but let me take away the arrows, and it's much harder now to see which result is which. So this is a point where we again thought that maybe, maybe if we put images in there, that could help. Right? So if I can see that this is about a car, that might help. If I can see that this is about the animal, that might help you tease out which results you're really interested in. So we thought that these might help in these diversified result situations. But then we also were curious to see if it might just help in the general case as well. Okay. 
So it turns out we aren't the first people to have thought about this. Um, there were a number of commercial search engines. A lot of these were from back in the uh, you know, mid-2000 range, 2005, 2010 range, where people tried this. Uh, some of you are nodding your heads, like I, I think you may have experienced some of these engines. ViewZ was one. Uh, it was very graphical-oriented. SearchMe, cool, was another. SearchCube was kind of the weirdest. It put the results on this cube that you could spin around, and I never quite understood how to do the spinning of the cube. Um, so these didn't work out so well. Um, none of these companies exist in the same form anymore. Well, we didn't want to let other people's failure get in the way of our own failure, so we decided we'd keep going. Um, so we wanted to see what had been done in terms of previous research in this area. Uh, and it turns out that from the research side, there were really kind of three approaches that people had looked at. One was to create these thumbnail images of the web page. You just shrink the web page down and show somebody that. The other was to create these sort of collages where you take parts of the web page and put them together with textual components. And it created this sort of collage thing. And then the final approach was the one that we were the most interested in, which was grabbing an image from that underlying page and putting it next to the textual components, so using a single image. So I'm going to talk about some of the, each of these approaches for a second. So first, in terms of thumbnails, people have been looking at thumbnails for a long time. And there was some great research that was done uh, back in the early 2000s to look at how big the thumbnails need to be so that you can actually figure out what they're about. And um, Sean Kasten and Saul Greenberg and, and folks did this work. And they actually found out that thumbnails have to be kind of big, about 200 by 200 pixels to actually recognize them. Okay, So small thumbnails, it's harder to tell what they're about. Uh, Anna Ula did some work looking at um, how well thumbnails could be used as part of a search surrogate. So if I include a thumbnail with things like the title and the URL, does that help? And it turns out it does. Thumbnails plus text did better than text only. And thumbnails alone actually did the worst. If you just had the thumbnail, that didn't perform so well in a relevant prediction task. So what about these collages of uh, visual and textual elements? Um, these are kind of interesting. People will take some visual element from the page, a thumbnail or a dominant image, and then overlay text on top of it. And so two examples of that are some work that Woodruff did where they did this sort of overlaying of text. And they actually found that that worked out pretty well, um, that this, this enhanced thumbnail was faster in um, search tasks than text only. Uh, Jamie Teven and folks at Microsoft did some work looking at what they called visual snippets, where they took a dominant image and they took some textual components and put them together. And they found that thumbnails by themselves actually did uh, had the most number of clicks. Now, in this case, number of clicks is kind of bad, right? Because if you're having to do a lot of clicks in your search, that means it's not working out so well. The visual snippets that they created were kind of in the middle. And then the text only actually turned out to be the best. Right, so we're getting a little mixed message here about how good these things are. Uh, and they didn't find any difference in terms of task times, how long it took people to do these search tasks. Um, now, here's the one that we were interested. Pull the image from the underlying page and try to do something smart with it. So there, there have been a, a number of studies that have looked at this. Uh, Lee looked at doing something real similar to what we are talking about, where they put the image right next to the textual components. And they called that an image augmented surrogate. They found that that led to fewer clicks, less time to do a search. Yay, looks like it's going to work. Uh, but then some other folks came along and found mixed results. So they used images in a content guessing. Can you guess what this page is about? And they had kind of mixed results there. It depended on the task. Some tasks the images helped with, some they didn't. Uh, Lumacus found no differences when they put pictures next to the search results. But they found that users really liked the pictures. OK, that's nice. Uh, and then Al McFally uh, also did another study where they put different kinds of images with the text, and they found no differences. So at the end of the day here, we didn't know what to think. Lots of mixed messages. So we felt, all right, let's keep, let's keep looking at this. So the question again is, can we improve things? Can we make things better by putting images next to the results? But we have to be open to the idea that the images actually might hurt in some way. 
right? They might slow people down because they get all caught up looking at the images. The images might convey the wrong information. Okay, so we have to be open to the idea that they could hurt performance. All right, so just to be very clear, our focus is we're going to take one of the images from the underlying web page. So here's a picture of the car, and we're going to move it and put it up. Here's the picture of the Jaguar. We're going to move it and put it up next to the results, in addition to the textual components. So I want to now start to talk about the research questions that we addressed in the studies that we did. Um, so we felt that there were two ways that images might help you or hurt you. One is when you're making an individual decision about that particular result. So if I'm looking at this result at the top, does this image help me figure out that, that result, individual surrogate level? The other is when I'm processing the entire set of results that come back. If I see a bunch of pictures of cars and I'm looking for the animal, I might be able to sort of do a triage process there and say, huh, I'm in the wrong place. Maybe I need to reformulate my query. Maybe I need to add some words to it or change the query in some way. So you could either look at it from the individual judgment on the individual surrogate or in processing the entire SERP as a whole. And we wanted to look at both of those. The next part, we looked at image, what we called image quality. And quality is a little bit of a tricky term to use here. What it really is is how well does that image reflect the underlying content? So not all images that are on a page actually reflect the main content of the page. So the example I like to give here is on this National Geographic page about jaguars, they are advertising another page about birds, and so they're pictures of birds. So if I picked that image and I put it next to this, you're going to think this is about birds, not jaguars, and that would be misleading. There are advertisements. There are all kinds of random images on pages that we might not want to use. Okay? So does the goodness or badness of an image in reflecting the page content, we well, would think that would make a difference, but we wanted to look at it. Kind of as endpoints, right? If, if we picked really good images, that would tell us one thing if, people, if they helped. If we picked really bad images, that would tell us another thing. And then finally was this question, the suspicion that we had that when you have diversified results, right? Remember the ambiguous query? Jaguar could be cars or cats. When you've got ambiguous uh, query and diversified results, we had this gut feeling that maybe the images would help you sort things out more in that case than in a general case where all the results that came back are generally homogenous. Okay? So we wanted to look at that. But that can really only be looked at in the context of the whole SERP. All right, so these are the things that we looked at in our study, and they sort of map onto research questions like this. Um, do images help? Does image quality matter? And does the diversified uh, results, do the images help more there? So we did two studies to look at this, and they kind of line up on the questions the way this diagram shows you. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of details on these studies. So. Uh, hang on to your hats, because these were complicated studies. Uh, and, and I hope I don't lose anybody. But if you have a question, interrupt me. I'm happy to take questions so we go through it. So I want to give you a, a little overview of each of the two studies before we go into the details about how we set them up and the experimental variables and so on. So in the first study, um, we asked people to make individual surrogate judgments. So we showed you a surrogate. We gave you a task. So here's the task. Find information about this Jake Clamata, who's a boxer. Um, and here's the surrogate. And now you have to make a judgment. Is this underlying page useful or not useful, do you think, for this task? And it was forced. You had to make the judgment. You either think it's going to be useful or not. Okay, so it's a relevance judgment. And then in the second study, we gave you a task, uh, and we preceded the query. Okay, so we, we sort of rigged this to use the query that we wanted to use. And then we showed you a page of results, and we asked you to interact with those results. You could click on them, and you could then find out if any of them actually answered that query or not. And when you found one, you would say, I found it. Okay? So I'll go into more details here in a minute, but that's the general idea. So we had a number of experimental variables that we were trying to control here. First was the search task. And we really wanted a broad base of tasks. So we actually developed 150 search tasks. And I'll talk about how we did that in a minute. But they were all generally of the form, 
find information about topic X. So they were pretty high-level kinds of tasks that were really geared at the relevance decisions. The query type, we've talked about that. The query that we used as the seed was either ambiguous or unambiguous. Um, the ambiguous queries led to more diversified results. The unambiguous led to more homogeneous results. And then finally, we were interested in that question about image type, right? The good versus the bad. Well, we also wanted to see what happens you know, in a real world setting, if you were doing this, you're probably not going to have perfectly good images. You're going to be somewhere in the middle. So we, we also set up a condition that was mixed. Um, and then as our baseline, we chose no images. So we actually had four conditions there. All right, let me talk about how we created these search tasks, because we, this uh, was really a, a long process. We had a goal that we wanted to create tasks that would support both the unambiguous and ambiguous queries. Um, and so what we did is we needed to find things that were ambiguous or had some ambiguous component to them. So we went out to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has these pages called disambiguation pages, right? I'm sure you've landed on these before, but if you search for Jaguar on Wikipedia, it'll come back with this page that says, did you mean Jaguar the car, or Jaguar the cat, or Jaguar the sports team? And so we went out and crawled those pages, and that's how we found our entities to use for, um, for the study. Um, Submitted any queries that we found or any entities that we found that didn't actually exist in a search engine query log. So we had access to this great AOL query log that shows searches that people had actually done. So these ambiguous queries, these are things that people actually had searched for. We, we pulled those out. Um, and then we went through and we sort of manually selected 150 of these that really we felt had popular senses to them, right? Some things are sort of esoterically ambiguous, but we wanted things that we felt like people would understand, like this Jaguar example. And then the task descriptions that we wrote would say something like, find information about Pandora, and then we would include this disambiguation part so the person knew which sense of the term they were looking for. But we also needed queries. We needed our seed queries. Now, for the unambiguous queries, we could just search for Pandora or Jaguar, right? That's the entity. But for the ambiguous, I'm sorry, for the ambiguous one, we could use that. For the unambiguous ones, we actually needed real queries. We needed to know how people would disambiguate this. And we worried that if we wrote the queries, uh, we might bias it in some way. And so we went out and we turned to crowdsourcing. Let's let people tell us what they would write for their own queries. So we put this on the Mechanical Turk, the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, and we just asked people to do these tasks and write the queries. And we recorded the queries that they typed in. And we did this with a redundancy of 10 people for each task. And then we looked at those 10 queries for each task, and we figured out, OK, here were the queries that were the most common. And mostly, you'd kind of be surprised, people generally tended to disambiguate these things in similar ways. So often it was the case that like four or five of the 10 queries would be identical. Okay. So here's what some of them looked like, just to give you a sense of how the queries and the disambiguation and the tasks went. Uh, so Achilles, Achilles tendon, uh, a Chevy Corsica car versus Corsica, Genesis the band versus Genesis the book of the Bible, those sort of things. Now, we also needed to control the search results. We didn't want to just issue this on live search engine because those results then would change from day to day. So we actually went out and cached all of the search results for all of those queries. So for every task, for both the ambiguous and unambiguous queries, we went out and programmatically grabbed the results from Bing on a particular day. So we got 10 results. Uh, we got the title, the URL, and the snippet, and saved those so that we could generate our own uh, result pages. Um, so in the end, you know, we ended up with 3,000 textual surrogates. So we starting to get a lot of stuff to deal with here. So basically, we retrieved a SERP for each one of those task plus query types. So here's what those looked like, right? So if the task was find pricing information about this Porsche and the query was Cyan, then we got a list of results back. Okay? So we just cached that. No pictures yet, but we cached the text, uh, title, and URL. So we needed images, right? So now we took each of those web pages, and we went and downloaded that web page, and we also crawled all the images on that page. So there's this great program, if you're a Unix hacker, called WGET, 
that you can use to grab all of the content from a page. And so we went out and we grabbed all of these images from the pages. And we were kind of blown away by this because of the 3,000 web pages, we ended up with 195,000 images. And I was starting to run out of disk space and all kinds of fun things were happening. This took a day or so to run every time we had to deal with it. Um, okay, so 195,000 images was just way too many for us to deal with. So we decided that we needed to write a very simple kind of filter. So we wrote what's called a rule-based classifier to filter out some of these images. There's a lot of junk images on web pages. Things like buttons and page chrome and little lines and headers and things that just don't relate to the page at all. And it turns out that a lot of those are named things like, you know, top underscore button. And so you can filter out some of those things pretty easily. And then we also did some other filtering um, based on some image features that are, are known to be uh, important for content. Things like the size of the image, um, the clarity of the image, the number of colors, um, those sort of things. So we did some really simple rules to filter, and we chose nine images from each page. Now, we thought it was really important, though, that we get human judgments on how well these images actually reflected the content of the page, right? So we've got these nine images that we picked. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. So what did we do? We again crowdsourced this. We put those out on the Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we said, here's an image of the underlying page. Here are these nine images that we've extracted. Please rate each of these images on a scale of one to seven about how well this particular image reflects the underlying content of the page. And so we got redundancy on that. We had five people do each of those. So we had a lot of judgments, um, computed our Kappa statistics for agreement, and they were reasonably good. They were 0.6, which if you look across five raters, that's not so bad. Um, and so we decided we had reasonably good ratings here. And when, then we set a, a threshold. We said if the rating was over five, that was a good image. And if it was under five, we treated it as a bad image. And we, we kind of looked at the distribution of those. And I could probably write a whole paper about how we selected those images. Um, but that's where we set those thresholds. Then finally, we also needed sort of our, our ground truth, right? Is this page really relevant to this task? Um, and so we had these 3,000 web pages. Um, and we needed judgments on those, so we got trained assessors. And what does trained assessor mean? Graduate student. <laughs> right, so we had two graduate students that had to go through, and we bought them lots of like coffee and donuts and things, but uh, they had to go through these pages. We had two of them rate 600 of them, and they had high enough agreement that we then said, okay, that looks good, and we had one person do all, all the rest of them. Um, so we treated that as our ground truth for all these measures that you're about to see. We reported accuracy and precision in things. So this is our ground truth. Tell you what, before I go on, I just threw a lot of stuff at you. Any, any questions? Did they know what they were getting into? The graduate <laughs> students? Yes, yes. I, I kind of warned Emily what she was getting into. But she, she was very good at this. She, I think it was kind of like a Zen thing. Yeah, come on. So you ended up with nine images from each site, mm -hmm. but you threw away some of them and you kept some of them. What, what kind of proportion did you have? Of those nine, how many did you have? Well, so that's a good question. Like, there were some sites that didn't have nine images, and we just took all the images that we got in those cases. There were some sites that had hundreds of images, um, and so we you know, were throwing away a lot of images there. You had a reading for whether you, if they were good or bad, whether you could keep them. Right. Oh, okay. So the good and bad. What we did there is we took the, the one that had the highest good rating and used that as our good image. And the one that had the, I'm trying to remember, I think we picked like the median bad or something like that to, to select the one bad image that we would use. So since we, we picked two for each, right. Yeah. OK. Uh, everybody with me? This was like one of the more complicated studies I've done in a while. So all right. So. Now I can actually talk to you about study one. Um, in this study, what people did is they came in, and we ran this on the Mechanical Turk. Um, they came in, and they saw individual surrogates, and they had to make the judgments. So this is just what I showed you before. They had a task that they were given. They were presented with a surrogate. And then they were asked, is this useful? Or do you think this is useful or not useful for this task? So individual judgments were made. 
And they made a series of these um, before they got to the end. And we presented these in sets. And the sets actually corresponded to basically a SERP. So we had, we had retrieved 10 results for that task. And so we just re we presented those serially to each person. Now, there were a few cases where we didn't have images for a page. And so sometimes those uh, didn't have all 10. Sometimes we l had to leave a few out because there just weren't images. So our variables here were the task. So the ones that we had to leave out took us from 150 down to 128. The ambiguous versus unambiguous query. The image type, good, bad, mixed, or no image. And we fully crossed that. And we also did a redundancy of five. So for each of those conditions, we uh, gathered five data points. Five people did it. Uh, the dependent measures that we looked at here were accuracy. So what we're looking at is basically the percentage correct. How many times did they say agree with the ground truth, right? Either yes, this page is relevant, or no, this page is not. How many times was that right? And then we also looked at their average judgment duration. So how long did it take them to make this judgment? And as I said, these were presented in, in groups of about 5 to 10 that, that mapped onto the, the uh, SERP that we had gathered. Uh, so we did this on the Amazon Mechanical Turk. And I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the Mechanical Turk. I've mentioned it a couple times already. Uh, the Turk is this great system that allows you to post tasks. And people come and sign up to do these tasks. And they're all online. So they're doing them at their computers. And you pay them a small amount of money for doing that task. So in our case, we paid them 10 cents. So if you do this set of 10 judgments, we'll pay you 10 cents. And it's this marketplace where lots of little tasks get done. Um, and a lot of them are, are things like what we're doing here. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's getting rich off doing this, um, but it turns out there's a lot of people that do it. There are thousands of people that do this. Um, but people try to game the system, right? So this is a crowdsourced kind of thing. And we don't have direct contact with these people, so we don't know. You know, are they, uh, are they doing the job honestly, or are they just clicking? So one of the things that we had to do was to put in these checks. We put in tasks that we felt were just really obvious. And if you failed that check three times, so we put these checks in periodically. If you failed three of those, we didn't tell you, but we just sort of didn't let you do any more tasks. We were like, thank you. We're, that's all the tasks you can do. Okay. So we cut people off if they failed too many of these. And what we thought was that if you're failing three of these, you're not really paying attention. You're not really doing careful work. Okay. So how many failures did you have? Oh, not that many, actually. I want to say out of you know, the, the several hundred people that worked on this, there were probably like five, ten, something. I was kind of amazed, actually, because if you think about it, I mean, we don't know these people. They're just coming onto this website and doing this task. Uh, we're paying them 10 cents, but they're pretty honest workers. Can they give you any information about where they're coming from? Yes. So Amazon has some things in place where you can restrict who you allow to sign up for your task. You can say, I only want people in the United States. You can say, I only want people that have a certain rating. Um, you, you get these feedback ratings. And you could say, I only want people that have a feedback rating of 95% or something. And I'm trying to remember, I think we actually I think we restricted this to US workers with a high rating. I don't remember what the exact cutoffs were, though. So I saw another question. Yeah. Oh, just to the other flip side of this is I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Billy Arani and Six Silverman exploring the, the uh, Turk, I can't pronounce it, um, Turk Octopon. Yeah, it's Turk Octopon. Looking at the people like yourself who hire these people who right. don't treat them very well or things that go bad to me. Try to empower these people who are doing this kind of work. So it's it's not necessarily that you know it's, it's a very complicated ecosystem here yes. that you're. It is a conflict. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because we actually ended up with a really good rating on Turk Opticon. Turk Opticon is the site that rates people that put tasks up. Um, and so that if you're a worker and you want to do these tasks, you could say, well, who's this Rob Capper guy? Should I do his work or you know, is his work not so good? Um, we actually ended up with a really high rating on the Turk Opticon, and our tasks tended to get done very, very quickly. Um, I mean, we ran some of these, and they were done in a matter of hours. So. Um, I saw another question. Yeah. Yeah, I just said in a matter of hours, roughly 
four hours, ten hours? Uh, all right, so, so this study, we got 34,000 judgments, and we did them in batches. So I think we did them in batches of like five or 6,000. And this one actually did take us a little longer because we throttled it a little bit. We didn't want one person to be able to do too many judgments, right? So you could only do up to 150 tasks. You couldn't see a task twice because that you would already have seen that and you'd sort of be biased. So that one actually took us about a week. Um, the other one that I'm going to show you ran much faster. So, yeah, if you want to talk about Turk stuff, feel free to see me afterwards, and I can tell you all about the trials and tribulations of working with the Mechanical Turk. Um, okay, so here's our results, um, and I'm just going to show you the results on accuracy. We also looked at, at recall and precision here, but I'm going to kind of focus on accuracy because the other two were very similar. So at the end of the day, good images led to a 2.3% improvement in accuracy over text only. And so there was a main effective image that was significant here. The post hoc test showed that the good images versus text only were significant, but 2.3%. Well, that's kind of small. We were a little bit disappointed about that, but it is what it is, right? It's a small but significant improvement. But if you look at this, overall the accuracy was quite high even in the text-only condition, right? The accuracy here in the text-only condition is up in 87 kind of percent range. So even without the images, people can make these judgments pretty well. I mean, you guys make them every day without images, and they work out. So another piece of good news, though, was that the bad images here, um, they didn't really seem to have much impact. Okay, that's kind of interesting. We're not entirely sure what was going on there. Maybe people started ignoring them, okay, because they were not good. Who knows? But the good images helped a little, and the bad didn't hurt so much. So overall, that's okay. So we were curious about this, though. Because the accuracy was so high, we decided to dig a little deeper. And we said, well, what if we look at only those cases where the textual that where the text only condition didn't do so good. In other words, the, the cases where there was some room for improvement, right? So if, if the text only condition had low accuracy, that means that the images might have more chance to help. So we created two bins. We created a low bin and a high bin. In the high bin, we put everything that had perfect accuracy for the text only condition. In the low bin, we put everything else. And there we found more of a difference. So here, the good images helped more like 24%. So when the text is not so good, the images give you information that's helpful. Okay, so that was interesting. Um, but on the flip side, there is a cost to that. In the high bin, where we had perfect accuracy in the text only condition, when we added those images in, Sometimes they hurt. So there was a 4% decrease there in the high bin. Okay? So 24% increase in the low bin, 4% in the high bin. I, I can deal with that. Now we also looked at judgment duration. So this is how long it took people to make these judgments. And when the good images were there, right, they had an impact on accuracy, but they also had an impact on how long it took you to make the judgment. Uh, took you about 230 milliseconds or so longer to make the judgment. So we kind of interpret that that, well, you were looking at the image, right? We didn't do eye tracking or anything here. We don't know. But there's some evidence there that they were doing something that took longer, and it was probably looking at the image because that was the thing that we varied. Um, in the low bin, that effect was even greater. So again, we see that as evidence that the images had an impact. They were helping you, and it took some time for them to help you. Um, but in the bad, uh, I'm sorry, in the high bin, not as much. All right, so that was study one. In short, good images help a little. Image quality did seem to matter, good versus bad. Uh, the bad images didn't help at all here. The good images helped a little. Bad images didn't help at all. So... 
Next, I want to talk about study two. This was at the SERP level, right? That was the individual level. This is at the SERP level. And so what we did in this study was a little different. We presented you with an entire set of results, and you could click on them and go to the underlying page. You could see the page. And if you liked it and you felt like it answered the task, then you clicked this button up at the top that said, this page has the answer. If you didn't like it, you could go back and then play around with the, the rest of the results. If you found a page that you felt had no relevant answer at all, we gave you another button to click here that said none of these results are relevant. Okay, so that was the setup for this task. So the independent variables were about the same as study one. Again, we did this in a fully crossed kind of design, so we took 150 tasks, two query types, the four image conditions, and again, we did a redundancy of five. So five people did each of those conditions. We had 6,000 total trials this time, which is why it went faster. We had 6,000 trials instead of 34,000. Um, and here, we measured two things. We measured something called click precision. Right? So every time you make a click on that SERP to go to one of the underlying pages, we recorded that. Ideally, we would want you to only have to click one time that you find a result that is relevant and you just clicked on that one and that's it. That would be the best possible case. So click precision takes the number of clicks that you made on relevant results and divides it by the total number of clicks you made. So if you had an, a lot of clicking going on there, your click precision would be lower. We also looked at time to completion, so simply just you know start time, end time. Uh, and again, we used Mechanical Turk for this. We crowdsourced it, and images, uh, our workers got assigned to a, a specific image condition here so that you weren't seeing mixtures of the image conditions. So the results here, again, we found a very small benefit. In this case, it was not significant, but it was about a 2% increase for using good images across all the tasks. When we broke it up by the ambiguous versus unambiguous, right? So here we're talking about ambiguous, meaning the diversified results, and the unambiguous is the more homogeneous results. Um, in the ambiguous case, there was a bump, right? So right here, there's a bump where the good images did better. Um, it was sort of borderline significance there, but it was about a 7% increase. In the unambiguous, there was really no difference, okay? So some evidence, again, that in, in the ambiguous case, they might help out. Time to completion. This was really interesting. The good images didn't hurt you here. In the overall SERP, the good images didn't hurt you, but the bad and mixed images confused the heck out of you. <laughs> You're like, why are they showing me these images that don't have anything to do with this page? And so we saw these bumps in the bad and mixed in terms of the task completion time. Okay, so the results summary here for study two, good images did help just a little bit. It wasn't significant, but it was a little bit of a help. Um, can't be exactly certain about that because it didn't reach significance. Image quality, again, it did seem to matter. The good images had some impacts that the bad images didn't. And then third, for the ambiguous versus the diversified results, the good images did seem to help more. Okay, so we got some evidence there. So. You know, kind of looking at these things across both studies, um, in the general case, when the title and URL and the text snippet are good, images don't really help you that much, at least not that we found. When the textual components are lacking in some way, so that was our low bin in study one, then the images did seem to help. It makes sense, right? If the text isn't helping you, the images have room to help you. And when the search returned diversified sets of results, right, the jaguar, the car, jaguar, the cat, there did seem to be some room to help there, too. That was where we saw that 7% increase that was sort of borderline significant. But all of these things are contingent on having good images, and that's a trick. So what do we see as the implications of this? Well, images can help in specific cases. I don't know that I, if I were a search engine, I don't know that I would be implementing images in all cases, but I might use them in certain cases. I might use them when I know somebody's entered an ambiguous query. I might use them if I know something about the text that I'm returning and I know that it's not so good. 
And I think you could programmatically do that, right? You can think about what the quality of the text snippets are that are coming back to the user. Maybe they're short. Maybe the words are highly redundant, something like that. Um, and so I think some simple metrics could be used to help predict that and tell you when to use images and when not to. Now, the good news is, and this is not work that we've done but that other people have done, is they've looked at how to extract these images. And there are very good image classifiers that can get about 85% accuracy in extracting what we would consider a good image. And they can do it pretty efficiently. And so that's the good news. This is something that you could actually implement. So in short, I think that these images could help in certain cases. Um, I think they could be algorithmically applied. Um, but we may have an explanation for why Google is not showing us images with all our search results, right? They only help a little bit. All right, uh, that's the end of the presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'll, I'll be kind of honest with you. When we started this work, uh, I think we had thought that we were going to find more than we found in terms of impact, and we had hoped that we might do a series of studies on this. Given the results that we did find, um, I think there's some interesting work to do about these last points that I made, right? In specific cases, how can you apply this and how can it be used? I think there's also some interesting work to be done to look at sort of the user preference side, right? So we didn't look here at all about engagement or enjoyment. Um, you know, maybe people would enjoy these pages more. Maybe they would find them more uh, engaging to look at, right? So I think there's some work to do there. Um, I also think there's a little bit of work still to do in terms of, uh, if you're interested on the algorithmic side, uh, the image classification. So what we tried to do was sort of set endpoints, right? We had humans that evaluated these images and told us that these were good images. So this is kind of the gold standard. Well, I think it'd be really interesting to see how good can you do with algorithmic classification versus that gold standard. So those are some some directions to go. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you looked at using alt text for matching subjects and. Oh, that's a great idea. That's a really good idea. Um, there's a lot of features that you can use on a page. Um, I didn't actually use the alt text in the classifier that we wrote, but I did use the name of the file name, right? So if it included button or sprite or logo or you know some of those things were, were used as hints. Um, alt text is a great example. Position on the page, number of colors, spectrum of colors, those are all good things. So I was just thinking if you did a Jaguar search for cats mm -hmm. and you got to a really rich page about cats, then in general, then that's a great thing on Jaguar. So you may not find it if it's not, unless I mean, right. that would be a way if someone's done their best practices. Yep. There's a really interesting set of work um, that I think it was Lee had done where they actually tried to go out and say, well, if I can't find a good image on this page, Maybe I can take the words that are on this page and do an image search and find an image that would represent this page but is not actually on this page, right? So that's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, yeah. Hey, have you ever spoken to anybody at Google about, I mean, they must have had conversations about including images or not. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've ever spoken to somebody there about what the um, current state of the art thought is along these lines, we, and I've got to follow it too. So. We, we've had just a little bit of discussion, but not anything where I know what the research that they've done has been. So, so my follow-up is, um, I contend they would include it if somebody would pay for it, right? Uh -huh. So, I mean, if 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 they're if you're willing to pay to have your site, you know, ranked high in Google. Paid for, right. and and an image maybe pay a little extra to have an image there. I'm not certain I saw it in your study, but mm -hmm. but maybe it it leads to the speculation that including an image increases the probability that somebody clicks on that result because if it's yep. taking more time with the bad images, then people. Yeah. I'm speculating as to whether yeah. or not this is in your study. Yeah, um, people so are we, more likely. To we click on it. we did not look at the case where we had. Um, one SERP that had some surrogates with images and some without. But I think that's a really interesting uh, hypothesis, right, that maybe the images attract you to think that that result is better, 
Um, and that could get into issues about trust of that site, reputation of that site, right? So that's a really interesting idea. So the reason I speculated on it is I think that your, your, uh, when you had bad images and mixed, uh, people took more time, right? Right. Is that correct? That's correct. Versus the text only. That's right. And, and uh, th which means that the image meant that they clicked on it typically or not. <coughs> Um, so in, in those cases, with the bad and mixed, there was no difference in the click precision. Uh, I'm not talking about precision. I'm talking right. about the amount of time. Yes, the time was greater. So right. that, that's why I'm speculating right. that maybe just simply the presence of an image may lead to people actually clicking on that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah that's a great idea. Um, okay. Uh, I guess I have a quick question. Did, um, were you finished? Study one before beginning the study two. Did you know the results of the first one before going into the second? We did. Yes. Um, we had pretty well locked into the study two design, I think, at that point. But we did run study one first. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, I've got a number of questions. I'm, I'm sure I'll be more afterwards. Okay. One of the things I'm thinking is, is what if you? What do you take from this, not just into design, but into uh, taking advantage of what you've learned here, that the bad images um, can go to disruptive technology? I mean, can you say, okay, I'm going to make somebody uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make them put different things together. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or I've learned something about cognitive interference. I'm not even sure if that's a term, but um, which, which you obviously have learned something about right. that at the time. So, so I just kind of wondering about what, what you do with that as far as playing with the next idea of what to do if you're going to, if you want to have a certain purpose for a website, like you really want people to find it and everything be together, you know, as a design recommendation, but right. then play with it. <laughs> yeah, well, so um, I think our focus was a little more narrow on the, the search results, right? So. Um, this idea, though, about people's engagement with the results on the page is where our, our sort of interest is. And we had some other studies that this is maybe not exactly what you were asking about, but I'll, I'll try to see if it ties in, where um, if you look at image results, and actually I think somewhere in here I've got a slide on this, um, often what happens in a SERP these days is you get a blending. You get some web results, you get some news results, you get some image results, and they're all blended together. In the, in the SERP. And this is what my colleague uh, Jaime Arguello is really interested in. And so there again, we've seen some of these sort of spillover effects where if one of, the, one of those is telling you a certain message, so if all of the news results are coming back on one topic, then that affects your interaction with the whole SERP, right? It means that you feel like you're in the wrong place. Um, and we did, a, we did a study where we actually tried to tease out the whys behind that. So we actually had people come in, do some tasks in the lab, and then we played back their searches for them and had them narrate sort of their thought processes while they were doing it. Um, and we did see some cases there where there was a real clear indication that somebody saw images on the SERP and they were like, oh, I don't know why that image is there. Maybe these results aren't what I'm looking for. So we call it a spillover effect. So. Yeah, yeah, the other question I was is, it seems that what, you're, what you chose here was very concrete. So you know that the Jaguar example, those are yeah. concrete things you yeah. get a picture of. But what if I search for something with their luxury cars or something? What if right. I search for something where there isn't, I search for concepts? Yeah. Uh, do, yeah. do you think it would? <laughs> well, and that's a great question, and it's a point that we thought a lot about in choosing these tasks. Um, we we kind of started where our intuition was. We felt like this was an end point, right, that if we found a benefit here, then we might think, okay, there could be benefits other places. But if there's not a benefit in this extreme diversified you know, entity case, then maybe it's not so likely there's going to be a benefit in luxury car search either. But, but that, you know, we don't know. That, that's an area that could be looked at. Yeah. So uh, let me go to the back. Have you thought about looking at the effects of transforming the text into a visualization, information visualization of the portal, and what the effects of that would be if it's placed next to the standard text? 
That's that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if I have that slide. Um, apparently, I don't have that one in my backup slides. Um, there was uh, another research project, one of the ones that I mentioned, Al McBally, um, from 2010, and if you want, I can point to the reference, where they did exactly that. They put a Wordle up of the, of the page. And that was one of the ones that if you go back, um, there, there was no significant difference with that versus text only in their study. Now, that study was somewhat limited in the number of participants and that sort of thing, but there's at least some evidence that that didn't help either. Yeah, Luann. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting study. I think one of the really interesting um, things about uh, the machine with search engines is the failure of visual search. Right. Really, uh, because there are just such wonderful systems that are beautifully designed, uh, full of pictures, and seem like they were going to be the way of the future yeah. at a certain point in them. And then, uh, just as you showed, they just kind of failed one after the other. Yeah. And the, you know, the question is why? And I think it really comes back to the, to the, 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 the power that text has for us, uh, uh, the efficiency with which we were able to process text and how, how valuable it is. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's something that we think about now, you know, with these questions about visualizations, um, is, is, is not to forget how incredibly powerful the text is. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's my comment. But my question, I guess, is you can probably predict, is about other kinds of tasks. Yeah. I mean, you, did, you focused on a general yeah. subject task. Um, what about procedural tasks, how-to tasks? So, for example, we know videos are really useful for how-to kind of scenarios or ex uh, exploratory search. Yeah. Okay. Where we so I, more aesthetic and more, yeah. I, I definitely think that different tasks could be looked at here. And, and, and again, I'll kind of come back to this. We, we wanted to start somewhere where we felt like there was some promise, right? And this, this idea of identifying is this page on the general topic that I'm looking for, we felt like that was a component probably of all these other kinds of searches, um, but it might manifest itself in different ways in those other searches, right? So, you know, those are all things that I think would be interesting to look at. Um, and we kind of chose this more basic one uh, as a starting point. Um, and and I, I don't know, I can't decide. We didn't find a big effect, so I'm not sure, does that mean that, well, maybe I don't even go explore those other areas or maybe it's worthwhile exploring one of them and seeing if there's a, a different effect there. So, yeah. Uh, let me say one more thing. So you, you, um, you brought up a good thing about text a minute ago. And this is something that um, uh, some other students and Gary Marchanini worked on at UNC where they were looking at uh, different kinds of surrogates for video search. This was back a few years back. Um, and they also found that. It's very hard to beat text uh, for certain types of tasks. Yeah. So, so anyway, something common is recycling and reusing pictures. So you can see, for example, the same iconic picture taken by so many different websites with yeah. different content, right? Yeah. So um, did you consider that in your study? Did you consider duplicates of images or did you just select unique images? And avoid you know, I, I don't know how many duplicate images there were, actually. Um, I could probably go find that out. But the... Um, you know, our approach just kind of went into the page. We grabbed all the images off the page. We ran our little classifier on it and picked nine. Um, I do know that there are, as you pointed out, there are images that sort of recur, right? It's a common image. It's a public domain image, and lots of websites might use it. Um, but I don't know how many of those we had, and I, I don't know if that was something that, you know, would you be more confused if you saw the same image appear next to two different websites. Would you think it was the same website? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just to pick up on what's being talked about, um, I find that like, from my own searches that uh, images can be very deceitful, especially <coughs> on uh, uh, advertised sites or even on YouTube where you'll have a good looking girl or guy uh, as the thumbnail you click on it and it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> and so uh, maybe that's why part of my check is so attractive is because it's yeah. easy to sort out with the brain what you're yeah. getting right away. Yeah. And so I guess this is a hypothetical question, but how would you anticipate if your research had gone the way that you predicted uh, a gold standard that everyone could uh, trust? 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, right? Because as soon as you, I was trying to find my page that had the deceptive uh, pictures on it, but as soon as you have one, um, there's a potential to game it, right? So if I know something about your image selection algorithm, then maybe I can have my web page have an image that's going to be more attractive in some way that might draw people into the site. So I, I think that's a really, you know, that's an issue that if you started to implement this, you would have to think about. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the ways that I think about this more, though, is in terms of, you know, let's take it outside of the search engine, web search engine context, and put it more into you're working on a digital library or you're working on some other kind of closed collection. Um, I think it would be really interesting to see if there's a difference there in how images might help. And Marty Hurst has done some work in that area, um, looking at sort of putting figures and diagrams next to search results and found some benefits of those. Um, and so I think in other contexts, you might find a slightly different result. Um, let me go somewhere on that table. We have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Okay. Just, uh, Surrounding the meta tags from uh, right. I, I, I think that there's definitely potential for that, like you pointed out. I mean, we see that with YouTube videos and, and things that do use images as part of their surrogate. Um, and so, you know, I would expect people would be doing that if, if we use them in web search results as well. So. Thank you.